This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly brought to you by Casio Electronic Music Instruments. When a parent visits your website, they are immediately looking for the kind of experience that their child will have. They're trying to envision their child in your studio. And if they see happy kids, engaged teachers, a sense of warmth and community, they're going to want to see their child as part of your studio. You are so much more likely to hear from a parent who sees that than if they arrive at your website and see kind of large blocks of text with maybe a couple of small pictures mixed in. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. G'day, everyone. Welcome back to Series 1 2018 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to episode number 120, which is Season 1, Episode 4. And if you're one of my Inner Circle Piano Teaching community members, a very special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show. And of course, if this is your first time here, Thank you very much for tuning in and a big warm welcome. And to those of you who are regular long-time listeners, uh, thank you as well. Make sure that wherever you are in your listening journey with my podcast, that you are aware that you can download my app from the Google or the Apple stores. Just search for Tim Topham and you'll be able to listen to the podcasts and read blog posts and get notifications uh, about uh, new releases and things like that uh, all through one app. It's really easy to use and it's a great way to listen to these podcasts. So if you haven't got that yet and you're sitting at a computer screen and, and watching nothing and listening at the same time, then grab that app uh, and take it out for a walk with a dog or uh, while you're cleaning or cooking or something like that. It's a great way to listen. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, business, and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. The full transcript for today, show notes and links, etc., are all, all available at timtopham.com slash episode 120. In today's show, we're spotlighting one of our Inner Circle members who's going to share with us some of her thoughts about why having an updated modern studio website is just so important today and to give us some simple ideas about how to improve them, both for new and returning students. In fact, she's so passionate about helping teachers in this area that she started her own blog and business building and maintaining amazing studio websites for music teachers. We'll talk more about that in the show today. My guest today owns Hello Piano Studio, a group piano studio in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It's always great having Inner Circle members on the show to talk about some of the things they're working on and helping other teachers in the process, which is probably the best thing. So first up, can you give us a quick overview of how your piano teaching looks at the moment, studio, location, types of lessons, and those kinds of things? Yes, absolutely. I own a group piano studio in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I currently teach 75 students and I offer preschool piano classes for ages three to five and then group piano for kids in grades one through 12. Rightio. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty sizable studio. Do you have anyone helping you with that? I don't. It's all me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's great. But that's the possibility that you have available to you when you teach in groups, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And so look, we're going to talk about how you've transitioned to groups as part of the process just in a little bit. Um, but first up, you've been a member with us since October 2016 or thereabouts. What are some of the ways in which you feel membership has benefited your teaching and your studio business to date? Hmm. I could probably take a good portion of your podcast <laughs> talking about that. <laughs> but a couple of highlights that have really helped both my teaching and my business are, first of all, your video series on the 12 Bar Blues was kind of transformative for a lot of my middle schoolers. Um, it, I, I discovered that series shortly after our spring recital. And our motivation was kind of flagging, as it tends to do right after the recital when you don't have another deadline in front of you and summer is around the corner. And so I rolled out the 12 bar blues and just started noodling with them as part of each of their lessons. And 
they loved it. They thought it was the coolest thing they'd ever done on the piano. And they were, every time they sat down to the piano, they would immediately go into the 12 bar blues. <laughs> so that was really rewarding. Um, you, you made me a cool teacher uh, <laughs> with my it. kids. So thanks for that. Um, and then on the business side, when I was considering my move to group piano teaching um, about a year ago, I was able to connect with a number of really rock star group piano teachers in the inner circle. And they were so generous with resources and advice and ideas for me. And it, it gave me, um, the courage to pursue that idea further and the belief that it actually could be done when I went into it really unsure. So, yeah. So both my, both my teaching and my business have really benefited from the inner circle. Fantastic. Well, look, I've been so excited to witness the change to group teaching that you've made in the last six months or so. So just just tell us how uh, you know, it, it's been a big change. And I remember you working through it uh, and asking so many questions of people, which is exactly what we want to do. Uh, would you would you look back on that as um, a success now that you've, you're into it? <laughs> yes. Sometimes it depends on the day, right. <laughs> yeah. but I'm still in the middle of a learning curve and I've had to learn to be really patient with myself because it's been such a change that it's a little bit like doing something new and I still make mistakes um, fairly frequently, but it has been a really exciting season and I ended last spring semester so in May or June with about 35 students, they, those were almost entirely private students. And I just had five group students. And now uh, I just started the, the spring semester this past month, January, with 60 students enrolled in group lessons. And so there has been a huge learning curve. But I love the energy and the challenge of working with groups. It's a very different kind of teaching for me. Yeah. And it's very inspiring, very motivating. And I feel energized at the end of the day, e exhausted, but also energized, right. if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And it's been really fulfilling to watch my students become good at making music together and to see the joy that that brings them. So it has been totally worth it. One thing I've noticed about you is the way in which you're prepared to commit both time and money to your own professional development, both through online memberships such as the Inner Circle and also coming along to conferences like the 88 Creative Keys workshops last year. How has your approach to your own development helped as you've grown and created new business ideas and moved to group teaching and those kinds of things over the last few years? Mm. So I'm embarrassed to say that actually professional development was not really on my radar until um, I joined the inner circle. That was really the first move I've made in my own professional development in many years. And if I could go back and do it differently, I certainly would. But the inner circle was kind of that first step. And after that, I worked with Daniel Patterson from Grow Your Music Studio as my business coach for two months last spring as I was considering this move to group teaching and planning for it. And Daniel really helped expand my perspective. And he helped give me the courage to take a much larger leap than I would have on my own and helped me communicate with parents differently. And I just benefited from that in so many different ways. And then on the heels of that was the 88 Creative Keys Conference, of course, in Colorado. And that was just a creative shot in the arm for my teaching. I left that conference with so many ideas. I mean, a lifetime of tools <laughs> to use with my students. And um, currently, for example, I'm working with uh, a bunch of my middle and high school students reading chord charts to their favorite pop songs and they get to choose what songs we work on. And so that's entirely thanks to you uh, and your sessions about that that topic at 88 Creative Keys. So again, you've made me a really cool teacher <laughs> to my, my students. So thanks for that. Um, so I would say that um, professional development has really opened my eyes to what is possible for me as a teacher. I see my own direction in my career now much differently than before. And I see much larger possibilities for myself than I did before that. And so now I consider professional development to uh, no longer be a luxury. Uh, it is completely essential that I invest in my own success. Fantastic. And it's what, uh, you know, people in schools do, in education, in business, obviously, there's huge commitments to this because it makes such a difference to people uh, in their business and their lives generally. So I'm so pleased that you've, you've taken that, that leap. And uh, if the inner circle was part of the um, impetus to do that, then that's fantastic as well. So Absolutely. We've, um, we've talked about some of this growth, particularly over the last few months. Um, what people might not know is that you've started to now branch out 
of teaching into running your own online business, helping other teachers with one of the biggest struggles we all have, and that's building, maintaining, and updating our websites, right? So what yes. made you decide to not only do all this professional development, become that cool teacher, um, move to group teaching, but now to create your own online business? Wasn't teaching enough work already? <laughs> you would think so, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, there were, I think, two main reasons for that. So first of all, just seeing what happened when I took that big leap into group lessons, it was so incredibly rewarding and exciting. I think that it motivated me to try to find another way to grow in a new direction that would be unique to my skills and experience and further explore what it is that I have to offer. It was, it was just such a, a motivating move and so successful, hard, very difficult, but so um, fulfilling that I think I just, I wanted a new challenge and, right. and I was seeing bigger possibilities than ever before. Um, and then the second reason is that my husband has talked for years about how exciting it would be to work together in some kind of music business. Uh -huh. um, I'm the classically trained musician and he's a rock and roll musician who grew up playing punk and surf music in LA. So we are from opposite sides <laughs> of the musical tracks. Um, he has a background in sound engineering. And so his attention to detail is really amazing. And so to combine that with my love of um, the process of attracting students through my website and what I've learned about that and the power of a website, those those two things seemed like a really great um, seem to have really great potential to combine. So in the end, building websites for music studios is a collaboration that uses both of our skill sets while meeting a real need in the world of music education. Wow, and I, I'm. I'm not sure everyone would be happy working with their, their partner full-time on things. <laughs> so how's it going so far? You've only been at it for a few months now. Yes, that working is a great okay? question. Uh, that is a great question. Uh, yes, it is. We do occasionally have creative differences, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have our own workspaces and our own work schedules, and that really helps. And when he feels pretty strongly about something, I, I typically respect his eye. He's very creative and has a really good eye for things. And then when I come in and, and have a strong opinion about something, he usually um, is happy to go with that. So, so far, so good. <laughs> Right. I'll keep you updated, but so far he's just a great partner to work with. I'm going to guess that um, seeing yourself as more than a piano teacher or seeing yourself, starting to see yourself as an entrepreneur, which is exactly what you are, uh, might have been part of what you said was hard at, at, at first because I think it's very easy for us to pigeon ourselves into I'm just a teacher or I'm just a piano teacher or I just do this. Um, was, was that a hard part of this transfer, that, that change in mindset to, you know, actually – I can do anything and th this is this is great this is going to be fantastic. Yes. It was I would say both yes and no. Yes, it is at first a little bit um surprising and and a little almost unnerving to think of myself as something other than a music teacher because that is what I've always been. But at the same time, I've been part of a local uh women's entrepreneur group in my town in my city for about a year and a half now. And meeting with them every month and listening to their stories and their challenges has really opened my eyes to what else is possible. And it's caused me to think, you know, maybe there are other ways to use my skills that would really fulfill me and would offer something really useful to other people. So it has been a bit of a stretch in one way. And in another way, it's felt really right and like a great fit to expand a little bit. And it just goes to show that's another group that you were connected with who have inspired and motivated you. Isn't that interesting? It just shows how what yes. communities can do for you. It is so true. Yeah, yes. That's great. So why did you decide to offer website-specific help for teachers? You could have done any number of things, I imagine. Why websites? Yes. So I built my first website about six years ago, and it was really difficult. Um, building a website is time-consuming. There is a really steep learning curve. And then at the same time, it's absolutely essential that music studios have websites. And so if you think about when a parent recommends you to their, say, their next door neighbor, that neighbor will almost certainly try to find you online before they contact you. It's what most of us do when we hear about a new business or we hear a recommendation for a new service that, that a friend likes. We go and try to find it online. The majority of my new students come to me through referrals 
and nearly every single one of them still contacts me through my website. They want to see me before they want to talk to me. So I've learned a lot about the power of a really great website. In fact, at this point, I don't do much to attract new students. I have about 50 visitors to my website every month. And excuse me, <laughs> in, the past, in the past six months, um, I've had 40 new students enroll. So I am able to spend my time now on becoming a better teacher or starting a new business <laughs> instead of trying to find ways to get new students. And that's what I want to help other teachers achieve. Right. So it, having a, a good, effective converting website allows you to automate that process of new enrollments coming in, right? Exactly. The stress of where is that next student coming from is no longer something that I have to deal with on a, on a weekly basis. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and it's, it's, it goes the same for me in my business. Uh, obviously, for those people who are watching this, they know that I run a, a business that um, has a membership and I have my podcast and blog articles that um, attract people to the website. And then that um, in automatic form in some ways um, enables people to step by step through, learn more about me, get to know me, and then perhaps they become a member later on. So again, I, I see the power of websites all the time. It's how I've created the business that I run. So it shouldn't be any different for people in piano studios or music studios of any kind. Absolutely. Okay, so let's get into your top five tips for improving a piano studio website. Great. So the first thing I want to start with is um, something that might seem fairly obvious, but actually it's, it's not the first thing you think of when you're putting a website together. And that is that a picture is worth a thousand words. So when a parent visits your website, they are immediately looking for the kind of experience that their child will have. They're trying to envision their child in your studio. And if they see happy kids, engaged teachers, a sense of warmth and community, they're going to want to see their child as part of your studio. You are so much more likely to hear from a parent who sees that than if they arrive at your website and see kind of large blocks of text with maybe a couple of small pictures mixed in. Yep, 100%. Yep. <laughs> it's 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 what people got away with in the 90s really. These these websites full of text on black backgrounds with blue text and can you picture those ones? <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, yes. if you're listening and you know your website <laughs> looks like this, then we, we need to talk, guys. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this is not not cool anymore and I'm sure we'll talk about text in a moment. But, uh, yeah, images, so, so important. And you can see it anytime you go to a website these days, it is full of imagery because uh, everything in life these days is going to video and going to Im images. And that's why things like Snapchat and uh, Instagram are so popular too. Okay, so top top tip number one was focus on your images. Uh, and I'm not sure if you're going to mention this, but um, is it okay to use stock images? You know, those images we can all picture of people playing piano with the wrong technique or the wrong pianos or it's backwards and stuff like that. <laughs> I think there can be a time and a place for really high quality stock photos. And, and yes, you'd better be sure that you're representing your studio <laughs> well through those. Uh, you just want to be really careful, first of all, about any copyright issues. You want to be sure that you're not... You're not using something that's not free for you to use or that you haven't paid for. And then secondly, you want to be sure that, yes, that is an image that really represents your studio well. You might think of using those kinds of images in um, not as highly trafficked areas of your site. Like that would not be a, a great choice probably for your homepage right. for a, a parent to click on your page and first of all see a stock photo. Show them what your studio looks like and then you can fill in with stock photos later. Great. And for those who are unsure, a stock photo is a photo that you buy that has been already photographed in a, often in you know, a high quality situation uh, that you can buy online. So there are places like um, Shutterstock, iStock Photo that you can buy images from. And also there's, there are places that have free images that you can use. Mm -hmm. Um, Pixabay, I think, is one that we we use sometimes. So um, do do look out for them, but do keep an eye on things. You cannot go to Google search, image search, and just grab a picture and chuck it on your website without knowing right. that there is permission allowed. Uh, okay, right. number two, let's go. Okay, number two is keep your text short and simple. And this is for the simple reason that um, we have a very short attention span as human beings. Uh, studies show that currently our attention span is about eight seconds, um, which is <laughs> It's getting particularly... lower and lower, isn't it? 
It is. And a goldfish's attention span is nine seconds. So now we officially have a shorter attention span than a goldfish. <laughs> and yet we so, expect uh, our eight-year-old kids to uh, sit there for half an hour and concentrate, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So you have the attention of your potential studio parent for a very brief window, and you want to use that window to your advantage. So explain to the parents briefly, succinctly, why their child is going to love being in your studio and why your studio is the place for their family. You can showcase your programs by all means, but know that you don't need to share all of the details until they are ready and eager to enroll. And then that's the time to share more details with them. Right. Yeah. So keep it simple, upfront, short, short paragraphs. Uh, I, I tend to on the blog use one sentence paragraphs more often than not. Mm. Really yes. uh, lots of white space around it. And then as you mm -hmm. say, you can go into more detail later. You could even do that by future emails or something like that. Perhaps you don't have to give every single uh, nugget of information right from the beginning, do you? Right. Exactly. In fact, if you notice next time you are on a website and, and find yourself kind of scrolling through the website, stop and notice how much of that content you're actually reading. And then think about your own website in those terms. Would you, if you were a parent, would you stop and read all of the information on your website? So it's just kind of a good, uh, a good check. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, Casio Electronic Music Instruments. As many of you will know, if you've been listening to the podcast for any length of time, I've been trialing out the Selviano Grand Hybrid Piano in my studio, and uh, it's now become my main teaching and my own practicing instrument, and I've got to say that I'm thoroughly enjoying using it. Uh, of course, many of you will know the benefits of a hybrid piano, uh, including things like uh, the recording functions you've got, the choice of different sounds, the fact that students or yourself, you can wear headphones while you're using it, you don't need to pay removalists to move it around your studio or house, and the fact that it never needs tuning and obviously limited maintenance. So they're all fantastic, but how does it actually sound and feel to play? Well, pretty amazing. Uh, and I really, I'm not a concert pianist. So to me, this is absolutely as good as a full length, normal acoustic grand piano. Uh, and it does have all the wooden keys and the normal mechanism you'd expect. So what I would really recommend you do is head to soundtechnology.com.au to find out where your local stockists of this instrument are and uh, go and test one out today. I really believe that you'll find not only is it a fantastic instrument, but it's also at a price point that really sets it apart from its competitors. Okay, so we've got number one, images. Lots of great images, clear. Uh, images of kids too are great. Are we going to, um, did we mention that or will you will you be talking about, you know, how, how to get permission and things like that? Yes, all of that will actually be in some blog posts that I'm going to be writing Ooh, um, cool. through my website, yes, to share more specific kind of tips than we have time to cover here. Okay, beautiful. Cool. Number two, short text, uh, punchy text, to lots of white space. Number three. Number three, make it really easy for parents to contact you. Yeah. So this, this may go without saying for some teachers and for some teachers it may not, but it took me several years of having a website to realize that putting my email address on my website was not cutting it. <laughs> so <laughs> right. for some reason, I thought that it would be fine for parents to just, it wasn't even a clickable link. They could just copy and paste oh, no. my email address <laughs> into an email and contact me that way. And you know, I did not get a whole lot of contacts from, from my website back in those days. So I'm it was bad. a really big lesson for me to take so long to learn, particularly given that I just could not seem to fill my studio during those years. So the lesson from my life is to make it very, very easy for parents to contact you. They should ideally see a big clear button on every page of your website that says something like contact me or learn more. And that takes them to a simple, quick form. And that makes it super easy for them to reach out. And it gives you all of the information you need to follow up with them. Mm, totally. I love the, uh, the idea of buttons. I mean, you can add a button very, very easily to a website. So yes. just do it. Call now, uh, free lesson, book now. Well, you know, any of those, but we've all seen them on websites. So please do it. Uh, don't just have a <laughs> an email address printed on your screen. Uh, I'm glad yes. you, you <laughs> migrated up from that one. Uh, <laughs> what about contact forms? Are you a fan of that? All those? I am. Yep. I am a big fan of the contact form. Yep. Why is it that? gives me body of information about the parent who's contacting me and you can require any of those fields to be completed before they submit. And so 
when parents fill out that contact form on my website, they give me their email address, they give me their phone number, they tell me a little bit about themselves, I have their name, and all of that information goes into my database, and that becomes my email list. And I can talk more about that another time as well, but it's just really valuable to have all of that information about parents because they may not enroll in lessons immediately. Things may not work out, but you want to stay in touch with them down the road. And this just ensures that you have a good basic body of information with which to do that. Right. And two other advantages uh, from my perspective is one, you don't have to share your email address online. So the contact form just goes to your email, but people don't actually see it. So if that's important to you, then that, that can be um, valuable. Um, secondly, I would add, yes, the, the ability for you to add cont- um, fields that people have to fill out, I think is, is really crucial. Uh, and as you say, you can add those, that information straight away. So you can get the age of the child, the, um, some of the interests of the child, the kinds of lessons they want, or you know, anything really that helps you uh, start that sign-up process with them. So yeah, fantastic. Exactly. All right. I think we're up to tip number four. Yes. Okay. So tip number four is to get feedback on your website. So I mentioned earlier that I'm part of a, uh, a local group of female business owners. And about a year ago, I asked them to take a look at my website. Uh, most of them are parents. And so I thought that they would also have some good insights coming from that perspective. I thought maybe I would receive some compliments too, because I was pretty confident about my website. <laughs> um, I was really unprepared for their feedback. Most of them were completely confused about piano lessons after looking at my website, <laughs> much Gosh. to my surprise and chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually wrote more about this experience on my blog this week. And in my post, I share what I learned about the importance of using really clear language on my website. But for now, the main point is to get feedback. Your friends and family will be able to see your website in a way that you might not be able to. And that is invaluable. Yeah, 100%. I actually, when I first built uh, my blog, I paid for user usability testing uh, with a service online. I can't even remember what it was called now, but I paid a, a small amount of money for, I think it was 10 people to uh, be given a five second look at my webpage, my homepage. Uh, from, they're just random people around the world that they do this for a living. It was put in front of them for five minutes. And then after that, they have to, had to answer, answer some questions about what my site was about. Uh, I can't, there was like three questions. What's it about? What do I want you to do? And things like that. And it was just fascinating and yes. terribly terrifying as well, hearing this feedback of people saying, I have no idea what this website's about or what I should do next or anything. So um, yes. you don't have to go down that route of paying people. But yeah, as, as you've done, just share it. Once you've built out your or, or updated your website to a point where you think it's it's looking pretty good, then put it in front of some people, particularly non-piano people as you did to see what people actually think of it. I think that's so crucial and potentially um, parents, friends of families and things like that. Great right, t- exactly. Great t- mm. Okay, and tip number five. Yes, tip number five is to update frequently. (laughs) This might feel a little bit scary at first, but the more you dig into your website and tweak it, the better your results are going to be for two reasons. First of all, as all of us as music teachers know, practice makes it easy. (laughs) Or if not exactly easy, it makes it easier. So the more you get in and learn your website, learn the back end of it, uh, which you, you already know to an extent if you've built it, but the more you get in there and dig around and change things, the more confident you're going to be doing that and the easier it will be for you. And second, regular updates actually help search engines to see your website as more relevant and that improves your rankings in music lesson searches. So if you build your website and just walk away from it, then a year later, you're not going to be getting the traffic that you need to attract the number of students that you maybe want. But if you're doing a web, a uh, an update every month or two, then that's going to keep um, search engines seeing your website as relevant and important to show people. Right. And it doesn't take much to do once you've, as you say, once you get used to the back end of a website and WordPress actually makes it very easy and there's even easier ones, those Wix and Weeblies and things like that, uh, it, it isn't that difficult. It's just like getting your head around Word or you know, Google Docs or something like that. It's it's not too difficult. So please don't get um, put off by the the need to keep things updated. It actually doesn't take too long. Uh, that would be my tip in that regard. Exactly. So let's just do a quick recap of the five uh, top five tips quickly, Jenna. 
Sure. So number one is focus on your photos. Make sure that they are representing your studio in a way that will draw parents and their children to you. Number two, keep your text short and simple. We have um, a shorter attention span than a goldfish. Uh, number three, make it easy for parents to contact you. Number four, get feedback, ideally from friends and family who don't even have any experience with music lessons. And number five, update frequently. Practice makes it easier. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, great. And, and all these tips are very doable by anyone. So I, I love it. Thank you for keeping them simple uh, and achievable for yeah anyone to, um, to attack. Uh, what would you say to teachers who are listening who actually don't have a website at all yet? Yeah, I would say you are probably spending far more time and energy than you need to on getting new students. I have certainly been there and done that. And a simple, engaging website will do that work for you and free you up to focus on other things that you love about teaching. Um, I think that there is a course in the inner circle that can step you through that really thoroughly. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, we do. We, we've actually created a literally a step-by-step -step here. Watch me as I do it on my computer and have in your hand a, a full color PDF download step-by-step -step plan of how to create uh, websites purely designed for piano teachers. So it's called our online studio launchpad course and it's in our resource library for members right now. So if that's of interest and you're not a member, you can find out more about becoming a member at timtoplin.com slash community. Thanks for that prompt. Um, I'd almost forgot about it. It's such a great course um, and one of those ones that uh, anyone can do. And the feedback I've got um, from members who have taken it and have done exactly what you've been able to to experience, which is suddenly I'm getting all these kids wanting to have lessons with me mm -hmm. and I've now got a waiting list, which I didn't have before. And I haven't actually done anything except spend a few hours to update my website. So um, yeah, check that out. It's the online studio launchpad course. It's really, really valuable. That's great. What about those teachers listening who are feeling embarrassed because while they do have a website, they actually haven't touched it in five or 10 years. <laughs> yes, right. You know, if it's genuinely been five or 10 years since you updated your website, I would actually consider starting fresh with a new website. It will probably feel more achievable, uh, achievable excuse me, once you dive in than trying to overhaul a site that you built years ago using tools that are now pretty much outdated. It may just be the easier of the two tasks. And, and also, you'll be able to start fresh with new creative ideas rather than trying to make your old ideas work. So... I think starting with a blank slate is a really um, a great opportunity to kind of reimagine where you are now as a teacher, as opposed to trying to fit where you are now into where you were then. Yeah, I agree. And particularly if it's one of those websites that's uh, <laughs> that's like what we said before with just a whole lot of white text <laughs> on the dark background with flashing things and red bits and oh yeah just just start again guys so much so much easier um yes. well talking about those changes you know we, we've mentioned that websites don't look like they did 10 years ago what, what are some of the changes you've seen in websites that can now break make or break a website in 2018 mm-hmm there are so many changes. Uh, I'm sure we all can it's think of huge, a bunch, isn't but it? Yeah. yes, it really is. And it changes so fast. It almost feels like it's a snowball rolling down the hill, like we're changing faster and faster. But um, but the way that your your studio page is found by search engines is continually evolving. And so for example, search results have become much more localized. So now if you search just the words piano lessons, you don't have to put your town in or anything like that just the words piano lessons, you will still get results from your geographic area. Oh, there you go. So I didn't this know that. matters. So it yeah. does that so automatically first up. It'll show you relevant things from your IP address, your location first. Well, yes, exactly. And so this matters when you're building and updating your website because by using your location in specific ways on your website, you can be found more easily by local parents. You can control that if you use your location in your website then another major change is, as you mentioned, Tim, mobile optimization. So 10 mm. years ago, <laughs> I had to check on this, but most of us still had flip phones. Right. Um, the, I believe the iPhone was pretty brand new. And so mobile optimization wasn't even a thing 10 years ago. I am a complete nerd when it comes to tracking my analytics, which is the data on my website traffic. And I'm seeing that currently half of the people who visit my studio website are doing so on their phones. Yeah. So... It, 
it is vital that your website looks good on your phone as well as on your laptop. So when you're working on your website, have your phone sitting there next to it. And every time you save it, every time you save your website, the work that you've done, go ahead and turn your, your phone on and have your website loaded and then just reload it and check and see how that, that new update looks on your phone. So just be sure that you're going back and forth and checking because half of your potential studio parents are seeing your website on their phone. Yeah, such a good tip. I have to do the same thing. I've got to make sure everything I do is mobile responsive and particularly those buttons that people have to click. Just make sure that if mm. you've got something that's got to be input uh, or received from the uh, the person using your site that that looks good, particularly on mobile, because if right. your uh, your one magic button that's going to get the contact isn't pressable or is hidden behind <laughs> something else on mobile, then you've got a bit of a problem. <laughs> yes, you do. One of the other important things that I found out about mobile responsiveness is that it actually does improve Google search rankings. So Google knows who's using mobiles and not. And they obviously want people to be sent to sites if they're on a mobile phone that are going to look good on their mobile phone because they want to keep people connected and having a good experience on Google. So they made a commitment, I think it was probably a year or two ago, to put mobile responsive sites ahead of unresponsive sites in Google searches. And so I think this is just another very, very reason, uh, important reason that you've got to be mobile responsive on your website. So uh, don't overlook that one. And if you are someone who has a, an older site that isn't mobile responsive, then unfortunately, you're just going to be disappearing down in the Google rankings and you won't be found anymore unless you fix that up. So yeah, good little tip. Now, let's just talk about Facebook pages quickly as we start wrapping things up. Why do we need to bother with a website? If you've already got a Facebook page that your studio parents seem to enjoy using and you can post pictures there and it's all really easy to do. Hmm. That's a really good question. I think that a Facebook page is a, a great way to share current photos and events and student achievements, things like that. I don't think it's a great place for parents to see the complete picture of your studio you want to be able to tell the story of your studio and to help parents imagine their child having that incredible experience in your studio. I kind of think of it as the difference between a few black and white snapshots of the Grand Canyon and a sweeping full color 30 second video of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> right. Which one would leave you convinced that you must spend your next vacation at the Grand Canyon? Mm, uh, that, that a concept of storytelling too, that the fact that you've got the opportunity on a website to do more than just have a few pictures in a, in a stream uh, that you can go into more depth, you can, you can tell that story. I think that's, that's a great uh, analogy for the importance of websites. Yeah, nicely said. Um, but the other thing I'm, I'm very conscious of is that I don't own Facebook uh, mm. and they can do whatever they want with any of our sites or pages there. So while it's important to have, and I certainly put time and effort into having a Facebook page, I know that if Facebook decides to delete my page, then I'm not losing my business and I still have my website. Is that a consideration for you and the people that you've worked with? I haven't thought much about that possibility, but I think that's a really great point. Uh, and the other, the other consideration with Facebook is that when you're posting new things and, and sort of building on this great Facebook page, putting a lot of effort into it, you have zero control over how much of that is shown. Right, Facebook yeah. figures all of that out with algorithms. And recently, uh, they have decided to put uh, friends and family uh, front and center in the newsfeed, which is great. But you see a lot uh, fewer, you see far fewer business posts anymore in your newsfeed. And so they're trying to keep that experience more focused on friends and family. And, and that's a great thing and is also going to hurt you if you are relying heavily on Facebook to promote your business uh, organically or to even just hope that your current studio families who have liked your Facebook page will see that, um, will see what you're posting. The, the results are, or the, the chance of people seeing that consistently has really dropped recently. Yeah, absolutely right. I think uh, Facebook is a great place that you can have a home uh, for parents to see photos and those sorts of things. But I, I don't think, unless you're paying for advertising, I don't think it's that valuable for marketing anymore because of those changes yes. you mentioned. I agree. All right. Well, looks, we're going to start wrapping things up. Uh, I would love to hear about your blog. You've mentioned a couple of blog posts um, and the new business that you've created. So tell us about that. Uh, and how it can potentially help people who are listening who might want a little bit of a hand-holding. Yes. So 
first of all, my husband and I have just launched our new business. It's called Studio Rocket Web Design. It's a web design service specifically for music studios. And the websites that we build are focused on effectively attracting new students for you so that you can focus on your teaching. I have also launched a blog through Studio Rocket, and it's a series of brief articles that will help teachers improve their website one element at a time. So that blog is a great way to become an expert at your own website through a series of small manageable steps. Love it. So is the blog at Studio Rocket Web Design? It is. Yes. Yeah. Our address is studiorocketwebdesign.com and the blog is right there. Fantastic. I love, love the name. And I imagine that when people jump on that site, they're going to get a, an idea of everything we've been talking about, the, the, the way that websites should be set up, right? This is, a, this is a demonstration effectively for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Well, we hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> no, it's great. Well, look, I know how long you've been working on this and the amount of thought you've put into it, the number of people you've consulted with. Um, and the, cons- the discussions we've been having both personally and also in the inner circle. Uh, I-, I wish you all the best for it. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's been a great to hear um, some of the amazing, um, you know, the, the, the building that you've done yourself in your own business and the way that you're starting to pivot and change as, as you develop, I think is just phenomenal. So congratulations to you. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of the support that you you and other inner circle members have provided that's an absolute pleasure oh it's it makes my day when i see other teachers uh having great wins being that cool teacher as you've said uh <laughs> that's always a, a real plus so thank you for the for sharing that bit of feedback but uh, also hearing when uh, people's businesses are growing and they're having real success with that so um thanks again for being on the show today absolutely thanks for having me All right, a couple of quick reminders before we sign off today. I do hope you enjoyed the episode with Jenna and have some ideas about how you can jump in and hopefully make a start on improving your studio website. And remember too that we do have a full course about this in the Inner Circle Academy. It's called the Online Studio Launchpad course. If you'd like a teaser about some of the things that we talk about in that course, then you can actually head to my website, timtopham.com slash events. There's also a webinar button at the top of the page. It'll take you to the same place. And you'll be able to see there is a webinar that we did about this online studio launchpad course. Uh, And we give away a number of the modules and a whole lot of tips and strategies for your website completely free. So do check that out if you'd like. All right, our reminders. Firstly, uh, on the 10th and 11th of March, I'm actually heading up to Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast, one on each day, uh, to work with the AMEB in uh, promoting the new Piano for Leisure for syllabus. So if you're in Brisbane or the Sunshine Coast here in Australia and Queensland, then please make sure you've registered and come along. Make sure you say hi if you're a listener of the podcast. Always great having, uh, having a chance to meet new people. So that's the 10th and 11th of March if you're interested in that head to the AMEB Queensland website. There should be some details there for you. And finally, a little bit of an advance warning that in two weeks, of course, we have the big MTNA, the Music Teachers National Association Conference. It's down in Orlando, Florida. First time for me heading down there and first time speaking for me actually at that event. And I'm totally pumped and I am really looking forward to hanging out with many, many of you. And I know lots of you are going down there. So if you are in the United States and can take a flight down to Orlando to hang out with me and a whole lot of other piano teachers, then please come along. Uh, It's in uh, March, towards the end of March, uh, and I'm sure you'll be able to find out the details online. My talk at that event is called Tetris versus Pac-Man, is reading in the dots or the blocks. Uh, And, uh, well, you just have to find out more about it when you come along. So I look forward to seeing you there. Now, next week on the podcast, I'm going to be pulling apart an article from the uh, Observer newspaper. It's entitled, Future of Piano Playing in UK is in Peril. Veteran teacher warns. It's a discussion about one teacher's belief about the negative impact that digital pianos are having on students' playing ability and the importance of competitions as a measure of the success of music education. Can you predict what I'll be saying about these two topics? Well, tune in next week to find out. I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, 
that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.